So Bob, you've done uh, a lot of thinking over the years about intellectual virtue, so uh, uh, it's a delight to have you with us for this conversation today. Um, I wonder if um, uh, you might comment on the following. Uh, Arthur Schopenhauer is quoted as saying this. He said, our moral virtues benefit mainly other people. Intellectual virtues, on the other hand, benefit primarily ourselves. Uh, therefore, the former make us universally popular, the latter unpopular. Is that the right way to think about intellectual and moral virtue? How do you, how do you think about these things? I wouldn't agree with that, uh, that statement. Uh, the knowledge and understanding are, um, are a good, a general human good. Mm -hmm. And the virtues that enable us to uh, pursue knowledge and understanding well um, include virtues that um, that involve sharing knowledge with others mm. and acquiring knowledge from others and uh, the processes by which we acquire knowledge are often uh, communal social, pro social uh, processes in which we're interacting with one another and bouncing ideas off one another and sharing information and so forth. And so uh, intellectual virtues are, are very other oriented in, in, uh, in of necessity, I think. Um, and of course, the moral virtues are often very good for ourselves too. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, yeah. uh, it's uh, people who are are just, or um, or um, compassionate, benevolent, kind, uh, are generally. Um, are, they, they generally do well uh, for themselves. Uh, there, it's, it's of course possible that in, in insisting on justice as a just person might, you could get in trouble <laughs> and, uh, and that, that certainly happens. But on the whole, uh, all of the virtues are good for both us as individuals and our community. What is the difference between an intellectual virtue and a moral virtue? When we talk about the intellectual virtues, uh, what are we talking about? Yeah, that's a, that's a little bit of a controversial question among the philosophers. Um, but I would say there are some of, the, some of the intellectual virtues have very clearly intellectual names, <laughs> like um, open-mindedness. That, mm -hmm. that seems like a, a virtue that's clearly intellectual and and pretty clearly not uh, merely moral virtue. Although there will be moral elements involved in open-mindedness, uh, a kind of willingness to, to um, be, a, a, maybe a kind of humility that would be uh, necessary for, for the really open-minded person. Um, let's see now, where did I, uh, oh, the difference between, <laughs> yes. Um, so, so there are there are some some of the virtues uh, are clearly named in a way that makes it makes them sound very intellectual. Other other virtues, other intellectual virtues, are named by the names of um, of moral virtues. So, for example, uh, I was speaking a moment ago about our our interaction with one another in in intellectual matters. And there, a kind of generosity um, is, is important. Um, one of the ways uh, that we learn from other, others is to learn to admire their accomplishments. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and that's, that's a kind of generosity, a kind of generosity of spirit. Uh, similarly, humility is a virtue that's both, <coughs> both moral and intellectual. And so the question might arise, well, well, what makes uh, intellectual generosity intellectual and what makes intellectual humility intellectual? And I think that the answer to that is just a matter of context. So if the context is, is an intellectual context in which um, goods, intellectual goods are, are at, at issue or, or are being promoted, then uh, the, the virtue becomes an intellectual virtue. Uh, Perhaps you could say that it becomes intellectual in virtue of uh, the community 
caring about intellectual goods. So, so there's a kind of a, a basic virtue, basic intellectual virtue, of loving understanding and truth and knowledge um, that's behind all of the other intellectual virtues like generosity mm. or, uh, or humility. So it turns out that Schopenhauer is wrong on another count because moral virtues and intellectual virtues are going to turn out to be actually the same kinds of virtues just in two different contexts. In large part. Okay. I think so. Hmm. I, I agree in, lar in large part and uh, one of the virtues that you didn't mention that, that, that complicates this just a little bit at least is something like curiosity or inquisitiveness. Hmm. On the one hand that seems really fundamental to the, the search for knowledge and understanding. It provides that basic motivation. Yeah. But you'd rarely see curiosity on any list of moral virtues. Indeed, depending on how you understand it, it could be considered even a moral, a moral vice. Right, curiositas is... is yes, exactly, yeah. exactly. It is, it, it's exactly how it's treated by yeah. Augustine and others. Yeah. So, the, the, so that's right, I tend to think that there's a lot of overlap and, um, but then, but then that there are some sort of outlying cases on both the moral side and the intellectual side that, um, that allow for some kind of a distinction. And I, and I think as well a very kind of s simple way to draw a distinction there, um, and it's a superficial distinction, is to think in terms of what are, the, what are the personal qualities that you need in order to be a good thinker or a good learner, right? And there, what comes to mind are things like uh, curiosity and open-mindedness and intellectual humility and intellectual carefulness and thoroughness and attentiveness, right? Mm -hmm. um, and then if you think alternatively, what are, the, what are the qualities that I need in order to be a good neighbor, right? Mm -hmm. And, and there you might think more in terms of um, kindness and compassion and respect and generosity. Now I completely agree that there are versions of those traits that also apply to the life of the mind, mm -hmm. and that's why you can't draw too sharp of a distinction. But if you think of intellectual virtues as the character traits of a good thinker or a good inquirer or a good learner, moral virtues as the character traits of a good neighbor, maybe civic virtues as the character traits of a good citizen. Mm -hmm. um, I think that allows for a helpful first pass way of making some distinctions. But if you look at the uh, reasons that the classic Christian thinkers yeah. had for rejecting curiosity as a, yeah. as a virtue, yeah. Yeah. you see that they are actually moral, moral yeah. Uh, yeah. kind of moral cri yeah. uh, criteria. Yeah. So for example, Augustine thought of curiosity yeah. as just a kind of indiscriminate yeah. desire yeah. for sensory <coughs> stimulation and right. sensational knowledge, maybe gossip right. and uh, mm -hmm. kinds of knowledge right. that we think right. are actually degrade us right. or are at, at, at best are unimportant, right. trivial or right. something. Right. Uh, and so one of the uh, virtues that, uh, that an intellectually competent person needs yeah is an ability to, to discriminate yeah. the important matters to know and understand yeah. from the unimportant or even mm -hmm. corrupting yeah. Uh, matters. Yeah. And I'd say that's necessary. That kind, of, that kind of further elaboration and characterization is necessary even for thinking of it as a genuine virtue. Mm -hmm. So unbridled curiosity or curiosity about subject matters that are either just completely trivial or maybe morally problematic, um, I'd say that's not uh, a genuine intellectual virtue, that, that, that intellectual virtues are motivated by a desire to know and understand um, important truths, however you want to understand that, right? Not the trivial or, or otherwise problematic truths. So, so, even, so all of that to say, Curiosity, as criticized by Augustine and others from a moral standpoint, wouldn't, in my view, count even as an intellectual virtue. Mm -hmm. It would need to be right. retooled in ways for yes. it to count as a genuine intellectual excellence. Right. Yes, but the point to see about that is that uh, it's, it's the moral yeah. Uh, yeah. quality yeah. of proper yeah. uh, love of truth and yeah. love of understanding. Yeah that, uh, that yeah. makes it into yeah. a virtue. <laughs> Partially moral, right? So, so I agree that moral, moral considerations constrain what counts as worthy subject matters. But I do, I think it's an interesting question whether there are sort of intellectually, intrinsically intellectually interesting or fascinating um, 
subjects or yes. issues or questions. Mm -hmm. yes. Yes. It, it's also interesting to think about the way that uh, being a moral person is going to impact yeah. sort of the, the way you go about any kind of intellectual search. Um, yeah. I'm thinking about, so I'm thinking about Pascal, and one thing that he says is that uh, the way that you search is going to be deeply dependent on how, how moral you are as a person. So. Um, so if yeah. if we were rivals and you yeah. had just published a, a great paper, yeah. uh, I would I if I were the wrong kind of person, I would be motivated intellectually yeah. to find reasons yeah. why your great why your great discovery was false, right? Yeah. Because because it actually turns out that being intellectually generous is going to require me not to be envious. Yeah. The the mm -hmm. my yeah. intellectual virtues are going to get hampered yeah. by a lack of moral virtue yeah. Yeah. in that moment. Uh, yeah, that's helpful. Yeah. Um, I, and it's funny, even in the conversation so far, I think we've kind of gone back and forth a little bit between a very broad conception of moral and a narrow conception. So yeah. if, if moral is just like being a good person or living a good life, then I think yeah. intellectual virtues just are moral virtues. Right, yeah. Because I think that part of what it is to be a good person is to love things and pursue things that are good. Yeah. And I think knowledge and understanding are goods. Yeah. And so part yeah. of what it is to be a good person is to love those things and to, to wonder about them and to, to pursue them in ways that are open-minded and tenacious but humble and attentive yeah. and so forth. And, and there's always going to be this sense that that being virtuous is it requires balance between all of the virtues, right? Yeah. Like you, the, the virtues can't just exist. Right. Oh, I'm, right. I'm an extremely rational person, and I have that virtue, but I, you know, I lack self-discipline. Right. Right. No, you just you can't do that. Right. It turns out, right. they have to be united. Right. Yeah. yeah. Yes. If you ask uh, why why we even have a separate category yeah. for intellectual virtues. It seems that the answer is intellectual matters, understanding and knowing mm -hmm. uh, and pursuing truth um, are extremely important in human life. They're, mm -hmm. they're an absolutely crucial aspect of human flourishing. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and so they, they warrant, you might say, a special, <laughs> special <laughs> treatment. Yeah. Hmm. Whereas, you know, maybe uh, if, if somebody tried to come up with a bunch of uh, football virtues, we'd probably laugh, <laughs> uh, right? <laughs> as, yeah. as opposed yeah. to yeah. the intellectual virtues. Yeah. Yeah. If you look at the uh, reasons that the classic Christian thinkers yeah. had for rejecting curiosity as a, yeah. as a virtue, yeah. Yeah. you see that they are actually moral, moral yeah. Uh, yeah. kind of moral cri yeah. uh, criteria. Yeah. So for example, Augustine thought of curiosity yeah. as just a kind of indiscriminate yeah. desire yeah. for sensory stimulation <coughs> and right. sensational knowledge, maybe gossip right. and uh, mm -hmm. kinds of knowledge right. that we think right. are actually degrade us right. or are at, at, at best are unimportant, right. trivial or right. something. Right. Uh, and so one of the uh, virtues that, a, that an intellectually competent person needs yeah is an ability to, to discriminate yeah. the important matters to know and understand yeah. from the unimportant or even mm -hmm. corrupting yeah. uh, matters. Yeah. The following is a tempting uh, sort of perspective, I think. You might think, well, content, uh, information, um, is taught. Uh, but virtues, character traits, and the like, those, those, are, uh, those are caught more than they're mm -hmm. taught. And so you might think that, that um, education toward intellectual virtue isn't going to be so much about the curriculum as it is about the um, getting teachers in front of students who exhibit these uh, these traits. Is that the right way to think about it? Does, if you're trying to educate for uh, virtue, for intellectual virtue, does curriculum stay just as it is, whereas you're just more careful about the kinds of teachers you put in front of students? How should we think about that? Can I add a category? Mm -hmm. I think also the, the so so not only is there there's the factor of the curriculum, what's being taught, and the factor of the teacher, but there's also the factor of the the kind of activities that are assigned. So the kinds of things that the students are asked to to habituate themselves into. Mm -hmm. um, I, I actually think that uh, that would be the first category I would press into in terms of what what uh, educating for intellectual virtue is going to look like. So are students in a situation where they're getting rewarded for one-upping each other? Mm -hmm. Or are they in a situation where they're getting rewarded for working together cooperatively to try to come to a solution? Mm -hmm. That's the kind of habituation that, that seems to me like a good place to start. Mm -hmm. yeah. 
I think the curriculum is very important, as well as the character of the teacher. Um, and um, the, w one of the things about uh, classical schools, for example, is that they, the curriculum is made of great texts. And these texts are great by virtue of um, the depth of insight and the uh, moral quality and the, um, and the artistic quality, uh, the artistic excellence of the texts. And uh, so if we're teaching students, if we're trying to form students' minds in such a way that they become excellent <laughs> as human minds, mm -hmm. um, we do want to, uh, for, for them to be feeding on excellent material. Yeah. Uh, so a, a course could be, could be taught by a very, very able and, and inspiring teacher and yet, if, it, if the texts weren't very good, it would be lacking in something, yeah. or something important. And, and just to push my point a little <laughs> bit more obnoxiously, I, so, so I teach in that kind of a classical setting, and uh, part, of, part of the reason why teaching in great texts is so wonderful is because it forms habits of intellectual virtue because the texts are difficult and beautiful. Mm -hmm. You actually, so, so just, just being exposed to those kinds of texts consistently forces a kind of intellectual rigor and also mm -hmm. develops a kind of uh, uh, aesthetic appreciation mm -hmm. for the greatness of these books. Yes, I think we definitely want to keep the aesthetic dimension uh, in, in the picture mm -hmm. um, and not separate it from the moral and the intellectual, not right, try to divide right. things up too much. Right. Yeah. Right. I think one, one point that's consistent with what both of you have said <coughs> is that educating for, for growth and in intellectual virtues isn't primarily a matter of teaching or talking about mm -hmm. those traits, right? Yeah. Um, uh, so it's not a sort of separate curriculum that gets pursued in addition to the academic curriculum. It's much more a matter of how you approach the academic curriculum and then, yes, what the substance of that curriculum is as well. And that suggests that there are at least, well, that there are multiple, there are multiple um, kind of variables that are worth thinking about here if, if that's our goal. One is certainly who the teacher is and the, the, whether they model the, the passion for ideas and the love of the subject matter and mm -hmm. so forth. And that's often what kind of transmits, you know, growth and, and inspiration in these qualities. But, but uh, like Janelle was saying, there are values that are implicit in any classroom, what, what yeah. gets rewarded yeah. and, and what, what, gets, what doesn't get rewarded. Mm -hmm. so, so thinking about um, setting up kind of the values of a classroom in a way that that will lead to uh, students asking questions and focusing on important details and working yeah. together and considering alternative perspectives, um, which is which I think illustrates a broader point about kind of the culture of a classroom, right? Mm -hmm. So ideally, what we would have is a is a is a teacher that's knowledgeable and passionate, mm -hmm. a curriculum that lends itself to to deep thinking and and learning about important ideas. Um, and then a culture that supports that as well in terms of what's the language that's used, what are the values that are used, or the, the values that are, that are upheld. Um, and then similarly, of course, there are, there are practices, pedagogical practices yeah. as well. And you might be a very passionate teacher, but if you don't have certain s pedagogical skills, for instance, if you don't give your students and know how to give them opportunities, as you were suggesting, to yeah. think well, to yeah. practice these virtues of the mind, yeah. right? Then if you're not creating those opportunities, they don't always yeah. happen, right? right. right. Uh, just lecturing, that doesn't, that doesn't always right. make for, for, um, for opportunities to think in class. So being able to, to, to structure activities, uh, be it inside the classroom or outside, mm -hmm. um, that give students opportunities to practice the virtues. Yeah. seems important as well. So it seems like a lot of different things yeah. need to be pursued. If I can highlight one thing yeah. you said, maybe this is a good distinction. So, so intellectual virtues aren't ideas, they're habits of mind, yeah. right? So, so you can't, I mean, you could, you could teach about intellectual virtues, but no amount of teaching right. content about intellectual right. virtues is right. giving your, that's not how you're gonna transmit an intellectual that's virtue. Right. You have to cultivate a habit within a student. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. And, the, and then that, 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 
allows, if you're thinking about this philosophically, it allows us to draw on a whole rich tradition of yeah. asking about how virtuous habits are formed. Yeah. Role models, exemplars are mm -hmm. part of it, um, but communities and practices uh, are a big part of it as well. One of the expressions uh, that you see a lot in connection with um, education and the virtues is love of learning. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I, I wondered how we instill a love of learning in our students, especially if we distinguish that from the love of knowing. Mm. Uh, so mm -hmm. I, I think I know people who love knowing, <laughs> but hate learning. And, and uh, learning is like going to the dentist. They'll pay a lot of money for it, uh, uh, but really they hate it. What they really want is, is knowing. Mm. And if that's a sensible distinction, how, how, how can we train folks up into the love, not just of knowing, but of, but of learning? Well, I think that um, <coughs> the uh, uh, making the process of learning enjoyable is is an important thing, uh, and making it enjoyable is you can you can make it enjoyable in part just by making it excellent. Yeah. <laughs> right? Yeah. Um, if 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 your method of uh, of learning of teaching is uh, very very rote, or if you're just, you know, teaching for the exam or something, then um, then the student might well and and appropriately hate learning. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But if you make it a matter of uh, of conversation with with other interesting people about interesting topics, and uh, and teach students uh, to be critical, mm -hmm. to to enjoy the the give and take of civil, critical interaction, then I think it's just, it just is enjoyable. It's, a, mm. it's, a, it's an activity that should be enjoyable for human beings because of the way we are. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, my first instinct was to say, something must have gone wrong for someone to not love learning in the first place, right? I actually think mostly people love learning and and it's it's maybe a set of bad habits that have been cultivated or a set of bad educational environments that have changed a person in into the, the kind of person who doesn't enjoy learning for its own sake because that's the kind of people that that's the kind of things that people are people are things that are curious yeah. That said, it's also it, there are there are painful moments sure. in the process yeah. of real learning mm -hmm. uh, when you're when you're really puzzled about something that you deeply want to understand. Yeah. It's uh, it's emotionally painful, yeah. um, but of course, if you stay with it, <laughs> you may <laughs> yeah. come up with uh, with a uh, with a solution to your to your problem. And and, and when understanding emerges. After that kind of uh, suffering, mm -hmm. it's especially <laughs> <laughs> enjoyable, yeah. right? Yeah. So, so the point there is, you actually need an intellectual virtue in order to enjoy learning, because perseverance in that moment of I'm going to keep I'm going to keep doing this thing that I'm not feeling like I'm making progress in. Mm -hmm. You actually have to have that virtue in order for learning to be something that continues to be enjoyable. Yeah, so it looks like there are things essential to learning that are accidental to knowing. Uh, yeah. So perseverance presumably is essential to learning, but it's accidental to knowing. A kind of industry, um, uh, uh, the habit of industry as opposed to sloth, yeah. um, looks like that's going to be essential to learning, but accidental to knowing. There are others, mm -hmm. uh, I'm sure. So part of, part of this, I think, is uh, uh, training students up into the love of submission, industry, yeah. uh, perseverance, mm -hmm. and the like of that. Mm -hmm. Uh, that sounds right to me, provided that you're thinking of, of learning in more a more kind of uh, um, complex, as a complex process that takes place over time. Because mm -hmm. there are simple things that we can learn yeah. without, uh, simple and interesting things we can learn without um, perseverance yeah. and so forth. Yeah. But, but uh, deep understanding of, of rich and important subject matters, that's hard to come by. Yeah. And, and the only way there, uh, or the way there makes demands not just on how smart we are or how much prior knowledge we have, but on who we are as people yeah. and on our agency. Mm -hmm. So even in our best moments when we've got the best texts and, we've, we've, we, and, and, and we're, we're um, performing well in our, in our capacity as, as um, teachers, um, we're using good methods, we're modeling good thinking, 
um, at least if your experience is anything like mine, there are still going to be a, a, a few students, right, <laughs> whose look on, looks on their faces suggest that they're not on board, they're not buying mm -hmm. it. And, and one of the things, and, and that group can, can be larger or smaller, but one of the things that I'm really interested in is, 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 is what, do, what, do we, what do we do about them, right? Mm -hmm. So um, when some of the standard methods for fostering intellectual virtues um, aren't working, right? Mm -hmm. What, if anything, can we do um, to, to, to get some of those other um, students on board? Well, I think we can engineer successes for them. Hmm. Uh, because we, we enjoy things that we succeed at. Mm -hmm. uh, we like those moments of yeah. uh, <laughs> triumph. Yeah. And, uh, and if, uh, if a student is tuned out and, uh, and disgusted with yeah. what's going on in the class, yeah. um, one way to do it is to, to try to marginalize the, the really active uh, smart kids <laughs> for, a, for a moment <laughs> and, uh, and concentrate on, the, mm -hmm. on the, the one who's slow yeah. and, then, um, and then make it yeah. maybe simple enough so that yeah. he or she actually can have a success. Mm. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I like that, and w and I think one point that illustrates is, is is how um, how it's worth asking of ourselves when we encounter students like that, what's getting in the way? Because right. because like you were saying, you know, so the, the 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 goods that we're trying to uh, to we're, we're inviting them to to pursue and enjoy are genuine goods, yeah. um, and so something's gotten in the way, and so asking what are the what what are the obstacles? What what messages are they telling themselves yeah. that that are getting in the way mm -hmm. of their engagement? And I think often it will be something like, well, I'm just not, I can't do it. I'm not competent, right? Yeah. Or I'm too afraid to fail, right? Yeah. So asking what are those messages, and then trying to create opportunities in the classroom to to address those, whether engineering for success or in the case of fear of failure, right, being a little bit, having a, having a, a classroom-wide discussion about, look, um, you know, we're all afraid of failure, right, mm -hmm. and, 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 and yet that kind of fear can be paralyzing, and if it takes over, you're never going to engage, and if you don't engage, you're never really going to grow. Mm -hmm. That seems like one really helpful way to think about it. I, I also think, too, that, that the the kind of relationships that we have with students, mm -hmm. they need to know mm -hmm. that 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 our classrooms are yeah. are safe and respectful places, right? Yes. And yeah. and it's fascinating to me why that's the case, and I, I think at least part of why it's the case is that um, character change is profoundly personal, right? Mm -hmm. By trying to help them grow in these qualities, we're asking them to internalize new values and and practices and and habits. Yeah. So that's 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 extremely personal, mm -hmm. and and I think you know uh, just as kind of a, a matter of common sense, we aren't generally open to deep personal change in relationships or environments that feel unsafe or hostile. Right. Mm -hmm. So being able to show students mm -hmm. that look, this is a this isn't a classroom where you're going to get personally attacked. It's a classroom that I think a classroom that values intellectual humility. P talking about mm -hmm. placing uh, values on certain things in the classroom, like yeah. elevating the value of intellectual humility, where where it's it's as good or better to to explain what you don't know or what you're struggling with, or to try to overcome something that you're struggling with, where that's rewarded yeah. just as much, if not more, than getting the right answer and getting it as fast as you can. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. So. Yeah, I think there's a there's a profound uh, good in the kind of relationship between a student and a teacher where the student isn't motivated so much by grades anymore mm -hmm. as yeah. they are by wanting to yeah. want it, the, the negative way to put it is wanting to be to be yeah. sort of approved of by their yeah, teacher, yeah. but it's actually wanting to have a relationship yeah. of of yeah. respect yeah. with someone yeah. if yeah. if that's an opportunity. Yeah. I respect yeah. this person. Yeah. And I know that if I do my best, they will respect me too. Yeah. Yeah. That's a, I mean, that's so much better yeah. as a motivator yeah. than any kind of yeah. sort of selfish, uh, I need to get an A in this so I can go to med school yeah. kind, of, kind of mentality. Yeah. And wrapped up in that too, I think, is often the experience of, of, of admiration yeah. and emulation, right? Yeah. In the same way that I, I, want to have a, I want to have a mutually respectful um, relationship with this person or we're, we're together, we're pursuing something that's yeah. good. 
I also I want to be like that person. Yeah. I want to think like yeah. that person. I mm -hmm. want to have the loves that that person has. Yeah. That's attractive. Yeah. I wonder if we could talk just a little bit about the relationship between uh, intellectual virtue and education toward intellectual virtue and civility and civil discourse. Um, it's no secret that there's a widespread breakdown in uh, civility and civil discourse, on, on especially on controversial topics in culture. And it's, um, I guess it's not hard to see that in many cases there's a, there's a moral failure, that uh, uh, participants in these conversations are, are failing one another morally in various respects. But I wonder if there's also an intellectual dimension to the failure. Is there a, is, is there a failure of intellectual virtue? And, Correspondingly, is there a way of educating uh, into virtue that would that would help us into more civil discourse and civil society more generally? What do you guys think? Um, let's see if we can uh, say what civility is as a virtue. Um, I take it that it would be something like a love. It, it would be a kind of patriotism. It would be a kind of love of the of the community. Mm. Um, but it would also be a trust in the mechanisms of government uh, mm. such that when one disagrees with the people in power, one uh, continues to respect the, mm. the, uh, the, the mechanisms of government and, um, and, and seeks to support those, those mechanisms. Mm. And I think that the virtue um, of humility is, is relevant to this, uh, to the practice of civility or the, the virtue of civility in that um, some of the, some of the uh, vices that undermine uh, civility mm -hmm. and make government in, uh, uh, dysfunctional are, um, are such vices as Selfish ambition, mm -hmm. to use a word from the Apostle Paul in, mm -hmm. in Philippians 2. Um, Vainglory, uh, arrogance, mm -hmm. um, the love of power, domination, mm -hmm. the kind of uh, uh, fixation on being, being the, the, power, the party in power or something of that sort. Um, so, um, e each of these, uh, as I understand uh, humility, each of these vices sort of re corresponds to a slightly different kind of humility, a, mm -hmm. a, maybe a variant of within the larger category of humility. And, um, and so, for example, um, arrogance is a is a disposition to claim entitlement to things that you don't have, that you don't really have entitlement to, <laughs> um, false, false claims of entitlement on the basis of thinking that you, of, of uh, overestimating your own uh, importance. Hmm. And so if you overestimate the importance of your party affiliation, you may be inclined to think that uh, you don't really need to listen to what the other people, uh, people on the other side of the aisle say. Right. And, uh, and that, of course, is poisonous for, for civility if you're, just, if you're just not listening to one another. Right. Uh, and so a kind of humble uh, listening and uh, taking seriously what, what the others say and trying to, to keep your own um, strategies within the bounds of, uh, of, of a the spirit, you might say, of, uh, of the American uh, government, um, that, would be, that would be a way, uh, an important um, uh, vir virtue to have, to, to head off um, incivility. And, th and that, uh, the, that has an intellectual side to it because uh, listening, <laughs> listening to the other side is an intellectual exercise, right? It's a, it's a matter of taking in, uh, being open to taking in what the others say and taking it seriously as something that a colleague is saying. Yeah. I, I wonder, Greg, if your distinction earlier between uh, love of learning and love of knowing, and maybe even a, a, a step further, love of being right, mm -hmm. 
is, is, is the kind of thing that you're talking about, Bob. This, mm -hmm. this idea that I would actually, I would rather there not be a solution than for the other team to have come up with a better solution than I have come up with, mm -hmm. right? I would rather, I would rather the, the problem not be addressed than be addressed successfully by someone other than myself. <laughs> <laughs> that, I, that seems to me like that's at the heart of some of the breakdown in civil discourse. Yeah. Um, and, and there is so the intellectual virtue there is is kind of a love of truth, right? It's I would I would I would I love truth more than myself and more than my own advancement. Yeah, to love discovering that I have been wrong yeah. uh, is, yeah. is is maybe an acquired love, <laughs> you know? uh, not one that just comes naturally and bubbles up out of our uh, nature. But a deeply important one if you're sure. ever going to be intellectually virtuous. Right. Yeah. Seems like um, it, if we take a little step back and say, you know, what, what is there a is there an important connection between educating for intellectual virtues and civility or civic discourse, civil discourse? Um, here's one here's one way to kind of try to bridge it. It's pretty straightforward. That if you think that that education should aim at producing good citizens. And if you think that part of what it is to be a good citizen is to be disposed to engage in public discourse well mm. uh, or in a manner that's civil, um, and if you think doing that or civility is partly a matter of being intellectually humble and intellectually rigorous and open-minded and fair-minded and intellectually honest, um, then that gives you a really good reason to think that, that educators should be concerned with mm -hmm. trying to foster growth in intellectual virtues because they're important to, to engaging in public discourse, they're important to other forms of kind of democratic participation, right? If you want to make a responsible vote, right, you need to ask the right questions, you need to look at the evidence carefully yeah. and thoroughly, you need to be honest with yourself. Mm -hmm. And I think that some of these things are timely for reasons that you've already suggested, suggested which are that um, so much of public discourse today um, seems to be marked by what you might even describe as epistemically bad behavior, mm. right? Yeah. So just looked at from a purely, how do people handle evidence of each other's views, yeah. right? Um, uh, and what you see is a lot of, a lot of being, being dismissive, uh, the person on the other side um, must be stupid, they must be ignorant, um, caricaturing of other people's views, right? A lot of just, in some ways, it's a lot of mishandling of, of, of evidence and other mm -hmm. epistemic goods. Mm -hmm. And um, intellectual virtues just are the, 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 the personal qualities or character traits that you need in order to handle those, those goods well. Mm -hmm. so, in so, so insofar as public discourse, um, is aimed at knowledge and understanding, then for it to go well, you've got to have intellectual virtues. Mm -hmm. um, now, you might think public discourse, whether it should be or not, is often aimed at other, at other goals like power, right? And that's when, that's when things get, that get, get complicated, that, that um, the, the goal of power and the goal of knowledge and truth can conflict, and so the qualities that one cultivates with those ends in mind can can be different. I wonder, I, it just struck me that there's another side of maybe the, the vices of public yeah. discourse that we haven't talked about, and that's uh, apathy or lack of yeah. engagement, right? So on, uh, there are a, a small number of people yeah. who we can look at and say like, wow, it seems from yeah. this outside perspective that yeah. there's the motivation is power rather yeah. than, than the good. But, but there's actually this, this much larger problem yeah. of, um, of despair, I think, yeah. of uh, many, many people yeah. just failing to engage yeah. because they're not convinced that, they're, that their small yeah. voice is going to yeah. matter in, yeah. in the larger picture. Yeah. So there's a different intellectual yeah. virtue there and like yeah. willing to be engaged even if you're not going to be the rock star, even if you're not yeah. going to be the one who yourself right. makes all the difference. Right. But it's interesting that, I mean, on one way of telling it, um, that vice traces back to the same love of power. So the reason I'm not engaged is because I love power and there isn't any to be had here right. <laughs> for me. Exactly. And so that same yeah. vice is driving things. Mm -hmm. So we've been talking quite a bit about uh, intellectual virtues and educating for intellectual virtue, but we all know there's a, uh, there are corresponding vices. There are corresponding vices, and, s and some of them um, are connected up with uh, the goods associated with the virtues. So 
Uh, we all know that uh, Paul warns against a kind of puffing up that often accompanies uh, knowing. Even not knowing of the, the right sort, you might mm -hmm. think, is sometimes accompanied by a puffing up. So what can we do to, to educate folks into these virtues whilst avoiding uh, these corresponding vices? The, uh, if, you're, if you're looking for a sort of large programmatic uh, answer to that question, I think that um, what the John Templeton Foundation is doing uh, in promoting the kind of schools that, uh, that Jason is, uh, has founded and um, calling public attention to the whole issue of vices, of, of in, or actually virtues, but then because of that, also vices, mm. um, is, a, is a, as a wonderful place to start. Uh, that's not itself <laughs> going to make anybody <laughs> intellectually virtuous, but it's a, it's a way of uh, beginning a, uh, an awareness and, uh, and calling on people to be um, creative in their efforts uh, to achieve something in this regard. Mm. Um, so I think yeah. I, I, I would strongly commend what Jason is, is doing in, in his school. Um, Namely, just sitting down there and starting to do it and think, think hard about what, what kind of a curriculum and what kind of teachers you want and, and what, how they should be uh, encouraged and, and educated. Mm -hmm. yeah. This is, this is um, in some ways more, more general, but also maybe a little bit more narrow. Um, I think if, you think, that, if you think that as human beings we're disposed more than we ought to be, toward um, considerations of power or selfishness, mm -hmm. right? Then it's unsurprising that even something good like knowledge and understanding, something that has um, power associated with it, mm -hmm. right, might be mishandled and misused, that it might puff up, right? Um, and that it might, you know, be used to harm, to harm or, or marginalize others. And um, you know, if you think that that's if you think that's kind of our our orientation, then certain virtues become really important to focus on and think about. And I think, um, just in my experience, thinking about these things and in some of the educational applications that Bob mentioned, um, I'm, I'm increasingly struck by the importance of intellectual humility. Mm -hmm. And we think about these things a little bit differently, but 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 on my view, um, if 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 I'm intellectually humble, then I'm going go, I'm going to be alert to, and I am going to be willing to acknowledge or to own uh, my intellectual limitations and weaknesses. Mm. I'm not going to be defensive about them. I'm not going to be arrogant or prideful, right? I'm going to be willing to say I don't know when I don't know, or I'm going to be willing to say that was a mistake. Right, or you know, this belief of mine—it's not as well supported as this other belief—and and your argument really did shed light on that, mm. right? So I think if if you start with a certain view of human nature, like the one I mentioned, then then the importance of of helping each of us <laughs> um, uh, be a little bit more willing to look at and to acknowledge um, our intellectual limitations would be a really good foundation. Um, from which to pursue some of the other virtues. Mm. It's interesting, Greg. So, so that verse, uh, the end of it is uh, knowledge puffs up, but love builds up, right? And I think it's interesting because most of the time when I read that verse, I think about it in terms of loving other people. Uh, but I actually think the right kinds of love of knowledge, um, a, as opposed to, so there's this, there's this love of knowing, which actually ends up being a love of self, right? I love being the one who knows. Um, and that's where you get these intellectual vice, vices. But if, it, if the love is of knowledge, that rather than of knowing, then you actually, uh, a lot of those vices end up getting, uh, getting overturned. Yeah. Because I would rather know the truth than be right. Um, and I would rather learn from you if you know the truth than uh, show the world how much righter I am than you. Mm -hmm. um, so, so it turns out that um, if, you, if you can combat a certain kind of vice with a certain kind of love, uh, both of knowledge and of the other, 
that's that's a way to turn uh, those those vices back into the sort of the proper functioning virtues that they were meant to be. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's great, and I and I I, I I love the idea of ending on love mm. <laughs> because yeah. it gets back to the re to the relational aspect of it as well. I think so yeah. often part of why we are defensive and do what we can to to either hide from ourselves or hide from others the limitations of what we know or of yeah. our beliefs or of our abilities yeah. is a sort of fear of of not being accepted yeah. right and and so if I'm thinking about these things in connection with other people and wanting yeah. them to pursue um, uh, the epistemic goods in a in a in a deeper way uh, I think that you know. I, I want my students to um, to admit what they don't know, yeah. right? And to and to take responsibility for that. Yeah. I think I think doing that in the context of of love for them mm -hmm. is uh, is critical. Well, uh, Janelle and Jason and Bob, um, all three of you, uh, I know, have thought deeply about intellectual virtue. And I know also that you're, um, you're known for, and I know you to be people who manifest um, the virtues with your students and in your writing and in conversation. So it's been a real delight uh, to think about these things together with you. And I want to thank you for joining us. Thank you. Thanks, Greg.